I wanted to have a title for my talk, but I couldn't think of what to call it. But I think what now, since love doesn't win elections, would serve very well. The Greeks who gave us democracy say there are three types of people in every society, typically three types of people. The first is the idiot, the second is the tribesman, and the third is the citizen. And we heard citizen repeated over and over again this morning. The idiot doesn't refer to the mental state of this person, but the idiot is someone who is private, who is self-centered, who is only concerned with their own individual pleasure, treasure, and gain. So that's the idiot. The tribesman is someone who thinks only about their tribe or their group. They are scared and suspicious of anything that's different from them. And when they need to deal with anybody or any situation that's different or difficult, they revert to violence. So that's the tribesman. And then last comes the citizen. The citizen is someone who is enlightened and understands that for them to be okay, society has to be okay. So they are socially conscious, they are alive to their rights, they know what their rights are in society, but they also know that they have responsibilities to society. And when the citizen needs to deal with a difficult situation, they deal with civility. For most parts of my adult life, I was an idiot. Yes. I thought that my education, my privilege, getting a good job, looking after myself and my family and my loved ones, was enough to immunize me from a dysfunctional society and an absent government. But I soon realized that I could not, my success was always going to be limited by the fact that I lived in Nigeria, or I identified as a Nigerian. So I learned quite late that I cannot be better than my society. Because the state of our society today is such that between the bad roads, the regulators that look the other way, the corrupt politicians, the ineffective public servants, the mortuaries that are masking as hospitals, all of us, all of us are only a few steps away from calamity and heartbreak. And that's no way to live. So when I was 39, 39, I voted for the first time. And I could blame military rule for part of that, but it's not the full picture. The truth is, as I said, I didn't feel connected to government, to politics, to what was going on in my society. But I learned fast. And so one year after I voted for the first time, I left the public sec private sector where I worked, very well-paying job, to take a job in civil society. A lot less, but more satisfaction. And I spent a lot more time with politicians and policymakers. And three years after I voted for the first time, I decided to contest the primaries, the PDP primaries, for a ticket to the House of Representatives. Now, what I learned from that experience was that not enough citizens are taking part in politics. What I learned is that our politics is mostly dominated by idiots and tribesmen. And the process is designed for idiots and tribesmen. So, it's not even enough to be a citizen who knows their rights and responsibilities. I think one more thing needs to be added to what it is to be a citizen, and that is to be politically conscious and politically active. So what does it mean to be politically conscious and politically active? I'll share. But before I share, I want to say, what is the reality of our politics in Nigeria today? And I'll summarize that in six lessons that I learned from contesting the primaries and from the work that I do in civil society. So the first lesson that I learned was that by the day of elections, there's a huge cry now for us to get our PVCs, to empower ourselves. It's fantastic. But by the day of elections, when we're standing in the sun, 
lining up. The truth is 80% of the battle for decent leadership has already been lost because we have no say in the process that gives us those candidates. And that's the second lesson. The second lesson is that our parties are fundamentally undemocratic. Fundamentally. Why are they undemocratic? The first reason is because of the members. If you read my book, you find out how I became a member. You cannot be a member of a party that doesn't know the real number of members it has in an auditable fashion. It leads you to the second problem with our parties, which is funding. If you don't have members who will fund your parties by paying dues and by contributing, then that means your funding is reliant on a few people who are in public office. The governors, the ministers, the president. Why is that wrong? I'll give you two reasons again. Because the first thing is the people who fund the party will dictate what happens in the party. They will choose the candidates for you. They will decide what the party does. The second reason why this is bad is because when they fund these parties, when these people that I've listed, these officials I've listed fund the party, where do you think the money is coming from? It's coming from the money that should have dealt with Mariam's issues. It's coming from defense contracts, which is why we can't deal with Boko Haram. So the truth is they're taking money that should go to health and education and funding parties. So that's the second reason why our parties are fundamentally undemocratic. The third reason is how they pick their delegates during the primaries. That's also fundamentally flawed. Your delegates are selected for how compromised and how compromisable they are. You have delegates that cannot read and write. And you educated people are sitting here to vote for the candidates that they selected for you. The fourth reason that our parties are undemocratic is the primaries process itself. And those who know politics will know that across the six geopolitical zones, we do have a common vision of rigging elections, but the ways in which we rig are different. So my story will be different from what happens in the Southeast, but just take, it, take my word for it or read my book. There are different ways to rig the primaries, but the primaries are rigged. So that's the end of the second lesson, that our parties are fundamentally undemocratic. The third lesson that's important for the reality of our politics and what it means to be a politically conscious citizen is that money matters. You can't run away from it. If you want to be a politically conscious and active citizen, either as a candidate, an aspirant, or even just somebody who supports good candidates, you must be prepared to fund your party, you must be prepared to fund your candidates and the people you believe in. This is very important for the reason I gave. If we don't fund parties, if we don't fund politics, we leave it to a handful of men and women who will abuse their powers. So money matters, and you can't run away from it. The third thing that I learned, the fourth lesson, is that information is key. Now, we keep talking about disrupting the political process. You can't disrupt what you don't know. You can't disrupt what you don't understand, what you can't appreciate. We have to understand the incentives, the drivers. We have to understand the politics in all our different local contexts in order to be able to disrupt it. So that's very important. And the fifth lesson is that politics is an industry. It has stakeholders who are generations old. I met grandfathers whose middle-aged sons were working in the, in the system, who were grooming their younger brothers or young sons to be also in the system. The same way accountants and lawyers have licenses to belong, the political industry has its rules for how you belong as well. And trust me, it's not paper qualification. It's something else. So that's the fifth lesson. And then the sixth lesson is that whether we like it or not, we have to admit that our elections are still compromised and not quite as legitimate as they should be. And if you don't believe me, look for the video of Ibrahim Mantu confessing on Channels TV on March 29th, 2018, about how politicians rig elections using INEC officials and the security agencies. So for those that are watching AKT and wondering why we're talking about so many security, there is a link between security forces 
and our elections and the results that we get from our elections. So that's the picture. It's not very pretty. But what can we do about it? The truth is, the world is leaving Nigeria behind, and even Africa is leaving Nigeria behind. I felt very moved by all the wonderful stories I've heard this morning, and I said, thought to myself, Nigerians are doing amazing things in very uncomfortable situations. How much more amazing could we be if we had the right conditions? The truth is, we cannot go fund ourselves out of bad governance. We cannot contribute our way out of bad governance. The ultimate power to move this country forward lies in our policies and our politics. And we're going to have to do something about it. The truth is, what is the root cause of what is wrong with us, why our politics play such a dominant, dysfunctional role in our development, is tied to two main things that I alluded to in the beginning. The first branch of the problem is that, yes, indeed, we are largely a nation of idiots and tribesmen. We need to accept that. We have only few citizens compared to our numbers who actually are trying to hold up a torch and lead the rest out of where we are. The second branch of the problem is that we recruit our political, technical, and administrative personnel largely from the pool of idiots and tribesmen. So we need more citizens. And for the few citizens who are here, and the people who are going to evolve to be citizens, there are some things that we can do to engage positively with our political process. The first thing that we can do, I think, is to study it, to appreciate it, to open it, to examine it clearly without rose-tinted glasses, not as idiots and not as tribesmen, but just as maybe medical practitioners with a microscope and understand where we are, why we're where we are, and accept it. The second thing that I think we need to do is citizens need to come together and talk about and design for themselves the vision they want for Nigeria. What kind of country do we want? This is very important. It's not enough to say we want a better society. In what way? If we don't paint a very realistic picture of the future we want, we'll be unable to see the path that's going to lead us out of where we are. The third thing we can do is organize differently. The truth is, I'm on many WhatsApp groups where I think you have citizens, idiots, and tribesmen in the same group thinking they want to save Nigeria. How is that possible? From what I described, the way an idiot thinks, the way a tribesman thinks, and the way a citizen thinks, do you think these three people can work together for a common purpose? I doubt it. So citizens need to learn how to identify each other and organize together. I'm not advocating to ignore the idiots and the tribesmen. Keep working with them. Maybe they'll come to the realization that I did, that we cannot afford to be idiots and tribesmen. But you cannot organize with them. You have to organize as citizens. You have to learn how to identify each other as citizens and work towards your common goal. And then I think we also need to be raising socially conscious children. I was very excited to notice age mates and classmates of my older son, who is 15, in the room, people who are slightly older than him. And I thought, fantastic. We need our younger generation. Because the truth is, the reason why I grew up and spent most of my life as an idiot was because I was not raised to think that I had a role in public life. I was socialized, and that's not to blame my parents, it's the reality of Nigeria. Decent, we hear this all the time, decent people don't go into politics. The same way when I was a student at Unilag, I had no interest in student unions. But we should care about these things. You have to be involved. You cannot leave it to other people. It's, in a way, it is selfish. It is idiotic to not go to ward meetings, to not be a party member, to not be a delegate, and to leave that, to abdicate that responsibility to other people who don't know better. So yes, we have to raise more socially conscious children. And finally, I think all citizens have an obligation to focus on trying to resist, to challenge, to ask the tough questions, to oppose, and to make their voices heard. And I think when we have more citizens in Nigeria focused in the right direction, we will finally be on our way to getting the kind of country that we deserve. Thank you.